My brother-in-law and my sister-in-law here. Yeah. And they're going to share their story. And I just ask you to be open today. Let's remove all of our walls. And let's let God meet us where we're at today. Let's welcome Chris and Misty Cog from Abilene, Texas. Let's give them a great big cross tab welcome. Let us give glory and honor to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. He is worthy this morning. He is worthy of all of our praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I give honor to Bishop Suey and uh, to Mom Suey, our family by choice. I give honor to uh, Pastor Jeremy Suey and uh, my sister, Pastor Danielle Suey. Aren't they all doing an awesome job? I honor my mother and uh, Rod Madden today. I thank them for being here. I love them dearly. And then my sweetheart who will be following me. Um, and, uh, and Daniel, Evan, and Liam. Amen. You may be seated. It was four years ago in December of 2015, at the age of 40, I received a diagnosis of the Asperger's Syndrome, generalized anxiety and clinical depression. I also have a learning disability and debilitating short memory loss. For those of you who do not know Asperger's, is on the high-functioning end of the autism spectrum. It was due to this handicap that I would encounter much misunderstandings, bullying, and emotional abuse throughout my childhood and teen years. I am very strong in some areas, but in other areas, my mind struggles, and my brain has to work extra hard to understand things that come easily for others which wears me out physically, mentally, and emotionally. I also have had a hard time coping with any sudden changes, disruptions, or problems, small or large. The truth is, I have struggled with my mind in more ways than one for most of my life. I journeyed and navigated through life struggling socially, academically, and emotionally. I was bullied throughout my childhood. My very first memory was being bullied on a daycare in Houston, Texas. This incident is still very vivid in my mind today. The majority of my school years, I attended my home church school, but for two years, I attended public school. When my family moved to Bossier City, Louisiana, and nearly every day I heard words hurled at me, such as ugly, weird, nerd, geek, and it's not in the notes, but also wimp. I was made fun of on almost a daily basis by my peers. I never felt like I fit in. I hated myself. I was also yelled at by the teachers on a regular basis. They became impatient with me due to my learning disability. My self-esteem, self-worth, and identity took a major hit in the mid-80s that impacted and altered most of my life. I was a sensitive child, and it went right to my core, and it stayed there. I believed the verbal abuse and took it to heart. I took on the shame and the anger of these individuals. I was also bullied at youth camps. I was hit among several other forms of bullying. The emotional abuse took a major toll on me before I knew it. I became addicted to rage myself. The rage had a major impact on me, my family, my relationships, and later my ministry. 
Any forms of teasing or comments would set me off. The pain, anxiety, and anger were so intense that it would culminate in me doing self-harm to my body. One day in 1986, I went into the back room of my grandparents' home and hit myself repeatedly in the face. There were other times throughout my childhood and teenage years that I would pull my hair and hit my fist against the wall out of anger. Furthermore, years later, I would entertain suicidal thoughts. Throughout my early teen years, I gradually became worse. In review of these traumatic events throughout my childhood, I became very codependent. I want to take this opportunity to properly define and describe what codependency means. Codependency has several different definitions, but the one that relates to me the most is an excessive reliance on people for approval and for a sense of identity. It's where you get your good and bad feelings outside of yourself. You also tend to make up a lot of things in your mind about what people think of you. In some cases, such as mine, it can be debilitating insecurities. You find your securities in others and give them control of your mind without them even, even knowing. It is birthed from childhood abuse and trauma. It can be from any type of abuse, which in my case, was being bullied, which falls under the category of emotional and mental abuse. Anything that is less than nurturing for a child is abuse. It was in childhood, high school, sports, conferences, family gatherings, and many social venues that this behavior manifested. Basically, I suffered with approval addiction. I created false concepts in my head that people did not like me, etc. I played the victim seeking attention from others through manipulating them with crying and rage. I took things personally and cried myself to sleep nearly every night. I encountered depression, fear, and anxiety on a daily basis. I dealt with several forms of anxiety, socially, financially, academically, and futuristic anxiety. I also struggled with sensory overload and panic attacks. The death of my father, Reverend Daniel Kalk, only added on to these issues that I have just divulged. My father passed away of cancer in 1991. When I was 15 years old, a critical time when a young man really needs his father. I was thrusted headlong into a world that I was unfamiliar with. I was dealing with several issues at one time, and the sad thing is I tried to handle it all by myself. When I was in the 11th grade at Life Christian Academy, our church, school, all of these issues peaked to a point of near self-destruction. I recall many days driving to school, pounding the steering wheel. It took such a physical toll on my body that I would literally pull to the side of the road and vomit. I developed a spastic colon and had other physical issues and I will spare you the details. My body rejected food on a regular basis. Anxiety and stress gets into the fibers of your body and it manifests physically when not dealt with. It breaks down our bodies. It was a little over a year prior to my father's passing that I met Misty. I sat next to her in school in the eighth grade. I was drawn to her and we became friends. It wasn't long before we started dating. She was 15 and I was 16. She was unique and special as well as beautiful. 
She made me feel great about myself and about life. Misty loved and was patient with me. And I, as I was navigating through the grief process, basically Misty had a front row seat and was very familiar with my ongoing battles of anxiety. The anxiety was not noticeable at first, but it manifested in different situations. I would worry about the most insignificant things. I constantly worried about the future. I did not take jokes very well and labeled them as personal attacks against me. As a result, it would culminate in an argument between Misty and I. These arguments would later on eventually spill into our marriage. I would make up my mind that no one liked me, but the truth is I hadn't completely learned to love myself. I had an unusual fear of people and crowds. This type of fear often resulted in withdrawal, isolation, and anger. Even in our own home when we hosted gatherings up until a few years ago, at some point I would isolate into the bedroom, whether it be from sensory overload or creating things in my head that were not even true. During my school years, I struggled in the area of math. I had a severe fear of failing tests. This fear gripped me to the point of headaches, extreme tenseness, and a pattern of overreacting. This would translate as an adult into the way that I would react to financial crisis, which had a direct impact upon our marriage. On an evangelist income, this was almost on a weekly basis. I would worry excessively about the future. The questions would surface in my mind such as, will I do this the rest of my life? Will we always struggle financially? Will we have our own home one day? Are we going to go bankrupt or end up homeless? That's what anxiety does. It allows you to think irrational thoughts that lends itself to a pattern of rage, overreacting, abnormal sleeping patterns, isolation, and depression. My codependency was at its prime. I lived most of my life dominated and controlled by what other people thought of me or what I had made up in my mind. They th that they thought about me. My self-esteem took such a hit that when I attended Bible college, I once put a belt around my neck. I would go to sleep and pray that God would let me die in my sleep and never wake up. My anxiety peaked to such an unhealthy point that I feared any kind of change. For example, if an event was on the calendar, it had better happen or I became frustrated. The truth is I demanded perfection of myself and I unfairly demanded it of others whom I led, pastored, and my own family. I transferred this anxiety upon my children. This is just one example, my oldest son Daniel was lost for 40 minutes when he was two years old. And for years, I felt that I had to hover over him. I could barely have a social life. Subsequently, I did the same thing with Evan and Liam. Literally, I would load the boys into the car as fast as I could, post-church or any other event to ensure that they would not get away. Yes, I kept my boys sheltered, but I also handed them anxiety. There was a time my anxiety, anxiety demanded they sit absolutely still, and I fretted at the idea of anyone thinking that my boys were less than perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue was not my sweet wife, or boys, <coughs> or even me. It was a mental sickness that was a beast inside of me that held me in Egypt 
like a cruel taskmaster. It was a demon straight from the pits of hell, but it was also a clinical medical issue that we could not clearly identify. It was physical, mental, and emotional, all three combined. I knew how to wear the fake smiles and stuff my pain. I used food to numb my pain at times. I knew how to shout and dance in church and even regress to comedy and goofiness and insinuate to everyone how great life was. I was chained to the stronghold in childhood, middle school, high school, Bible college, marriage, and parenthood. I carried it throughout my early ministry as a youth pastor, two pastorates, and as a worldwide evangelist. The anxiety and rage I dealt with my entire life finally came to a head in the year 2014. I was on the verge of a major breakdown. It was in a small community outside of Abilene, Texas called Buffalo Gap. My family had moved there one year prior. It was only four houses down that we met a sweet lady by the name of Tenny McCarty. She was a lady who is precious and sweet, but doesn't mind telling you the truth. Minnie owns a treatment center called Shades of Hope. This center is literally two blocks from our home. She had me diagnosed all in one night after being on a hayride with a group of our friends and family. She became completely aware of the symptoms in various social settings. These symptoms included anxiety, rage, and codependency. Many has a unique philosophy that it's abusive to point out a problem without giving a solution. Tenny McCarty became an angel who guided me safely to the road of recovery. She recommended I see a counselor by the name of David Stuckey, who is also a spirit-filled minister. I have been meeting with David on a weekly, bi-weekly, and tri-weekly basis over the past five years. I finally found a safe place, a compassionate heart, a big ear, and a life coach in him. Also, I was involved in two intensives. I attended a five-day codependency workshop at Shades of Hope. It was in that workshop that I did, I did core work on traumatic events in my childhood, specifically bullying and emotional abuse. In the final days of the workshop, I engaged in some very intense anger and shame work. The therapist, Dr. Carey, took me to the end of a dark room with other clients in my group, looking on as I released pent-up rage by beating a target with an instrument and telling the perpetrators of my past, I give you back your anger and I give you back your shame. I named them one by one, addressed them personally, and called them out. I literally felt all of the anger and the pain and shame pent up for decades released in those moments. The burden I carried for most of my life was suddenly gone. Following my treatment, Tenny and Dr. Carey gave me an aftercare plan that included group meetings, twice a week and continued counseling with David to maintain. I began to regain confidence and peace of mind but relapsed again in June with anxiety and rage. So another opportunity came up in Memphis, Tennessee. This was a three-day intensive dealing specifically with anxiety and depression. This intensive was indeed very gut-wrenching. 
yet more healing took play, place as waves of rage and toxins and tears poured out of me. In the aftermath of both intensives, I felt numb and fragile. But the peace I felt as a result was wonderful. I have maintained a consistent prayer life and have faithfully attended counseling and support group meetings. The meetings are necessary for accountability and support from others who understand my struggles and in return can help my peers as I share. You can't keep what you've got unless you give it away. In the event of any issues that surface, I have a direct line to my sponsor and therapist as well as notable others that I trust completely. My precious companion and soulmate, Misty, has been with me through these struggles and challenges. It was during the time that I dated Misty in the 10th grade and the end of our senior year that I based my entire identity and self-worth according to her feelings toward me. Basically, I felt secure and complete when I was around her. I could not stand the thought or mere idea of being away from her. Honestly, I felt at that point that everyone I thought were my friends had deserted me, except for Misty. She filled a big void that my father left. However, I depended on her too much, even to the point that I could not speak for myself. I was in love with her, but I was also enmeshed with her to the point that I was always worried about losing her. I felt incomplete, lost, and confused when she wasn't around. In addition, I felt people loved me when she was around, but hated me when she wasn't. This put a lot of pressure on Misty. Yes, I know how to pray and fast, but still couldn't shake the issues of self-esteem and codependency in my life. I needed professional help and to work on myself along with praying and fasting. When my father was alive, he made me feel like a champion. And when he died, I unfairly transferred the self-worth I received from him to her. Clearly, my sweet and beautiful Misty did not need all of that pressure. In addition, I hated myself and it impacted my precious bride for many years. She is now going to share how it affected her and give more details how we both found healing. Let us welcome my sweet wife. respect my husband deeply. I've loved him for more of my life than I haven't since I was 15 years old and I'm now 43. So that's a long time. I'm going to share some of the anguish of our story and how it affected our marriage, me personally and raising our children. You can't understand our victories unless you first hear of our battles. Everything I'm going to share is with Chris's permission and support. I'm going to be very raw and transparent in hopes to help at least one person here today. My many says, and I quote, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. What comes from the head goes over the head. Thank you in advance for letting me share my story and my heart with you. After dating four years with a little break in the mix, Chris and I married. I was 19 and he was 20. I never realized when I said I do in sickness and health, that would mean mental sickness and health. I just thought it would mean he had occasional flu or something and I would make him homemade chicken noodle soup and bring it to him and it'd be so romantic. I never, ever imagined mental sickness. There were some challenges while we dated. Chris never felt like he fit in with everyone else our age and he felt more at ease with adults than our peers. He was a bit socially awkward and couldn't read people. Therefore, there were numerous misunderstandings and people not getting him. Also, the grief of his father's passing was still fresh. I remember some of our dates spending hours talking him through all of this. 
whether it was about feeling as if no one liked him or if he thought someone looked at him the wrong way. I would pour a lot of energy into trying to help him see these things were made up in his mind, but he never seemed to get it, and soon after, this cycle would repeat. Despite the frustrations I felt, he was the sweetest guy I knew and had such a sincerity and innocence about him. This is what drew me to him, along with his deep desire to be used of God. I had the same desire in my heart, and it was one of the things that bonded us. After we married and more responsibilities were added to our lives, things quickly became worse. Christopher's anxiety increased, and depression was always lurking around the corner. Shortly after we married, Grandmother Kilgore approached me about seeking help for Chris. She explained to me that she had always felt there was something more to his anxiety and rage. She was also concerned about it affecting me. She knew early on the load I was carrying. She convinced us that he should seek external help, and she paid for him to see various doctors, psychiatrists, and psychologists. I went to every appointment with him, and we saw no improvements. Chris was prescribed several different types of medications, but there was never any relief, and eventually his symptoms worsened. He prayed, I prayed. For years we prayed together for healing and answers, and still nothing changed, but the prayers definitely sustained us and carried us through those dark days. At times I would feel resentment, some resentment and anger towards him, but mostly I felt loneliness and pain. I felt alone in my marriage. There were some good days, but the smallest things gone wrong, such as simply losing his keys or glasses, being late to church or outing with friends or a bill we couldn't pay, and here would come the anxiety and rage, and it would just snowball. He couldn't cope with disruptions or problems. He would take it out on me. There were some days I didn't want to get out of bed and face my world alone, but I did. I always did with the strength of God. I remember when we first had access to the internet, and I began searching for, yeah, we're that old, I remember when it first started. <laughs> and I began searching for answers. Everything I found online pointed to bipolar disorder, but Chris did not have all the symptoms needed for that particular diagnosis. I spent years searching for answers without finding relief. I would give up, then I would search again. We tried everything. At some point, someone in the Christian community even advised us to take Chris off of his meds at the time and quote the word of God over his life and pray through it. I want to clarify right here that I do believe in the word of God and his promises and praying through, and I've also seen him perform instant miracles. Our three boys are miracles. We pray for them, they're miracles. I am also that person who quotes scriptures and prays scriptures out loud over my personal situations on a daily basis. Most of the time, several times a day. So I do believe in quoting the word of God over your life and praying. So we decided to take this well-meaning person, well person's advice, and we took Chris off his meds. Chris's symptoms began to worsen, and we quickly woke up to the realization that this decision was a bad idea. On that note, I want to emphasize that if you have a physical problem, mental or emotional struggles, or a chemical imbalance in your body, you need to seek psychiatric and psychological intervention. It does not diminish our identity in Christ to use the resources available to us. I can say that confidently because I've lived it. You know, and, and you've heard it. We go to eye doctors, we need glasses, heart doctors, we have heart problems. So seeking out assistance from mental health professionals is appropriate when you have a mental health concern. Um, one night we were staying in the country out in the middle of nowhere, and Chris was coming off of his meds, as advised by this well-meaning individual. I literally had to hold his head in my lap while he screamed in anguish and his body convulsed in pain. It was for hours. All I knew to do was pray, quote scriptures, and sing until finally his body relaxed and he fell asleep hours later. That was a terrifying night. I didn't know at the time, but he was detoxing because we took him off the meds cold turkey, as advised by us, and we believed for a miracle. Detoxing your body without proper medical care can be extremely dangerous. God expects us to have wisdom and some common sense. We just didn't know any better back then, and we were desperate and willing to try anything. A few years later, we were back at the doctor's office, back on meds, with still no relief. So I advise you not to do that. <laughs> Chris and I evangelized together for 12 years, and there were moments where his fits of rage would manifest, and he would, what I call badger, badger me on our way to church service, and then rage again when we got back in the car after. I always knew on a certain level that his anger was not directed at me. I knew that, 
but it just wore me down emotionally. I tried my best not to take anything personally, but I grew tired of having to be the one holding it together and being strong. I'm just being raw and honest here, y'all. I would walk into church services after being in an argument in the car, and I would put on my smile and sing and minister to others, and he would do the same thing. And I do believe that helped us get through it. Behind my smile and his was a lot of pain and loneliness. And I knew when we got back in the car, we would step back into the same frustrating outburst. I knew it was also hard on Chris, and I worried often about the physical toll it would have on his body, physically. I wore a mask most of the time and yearned for someone to look past it and see how much I was hurting. I became the secret bearer. What I've come to learn is that we are as sick as our secrets. It's the kept secrets that keep us sick. I was enabling my husband without even knowing. We have three beautiful miracle children. Daniel is 16. He's the six foot three boy over there, the handsome boy over there. Evan is nine and Liam is seven. All boys. That within itself is an anxiety inducer for anyone. Just keeping them alive and fed. So that's where my anxiety comes from. <laughs> With each child, Christopher's anxiety and rage episodes increased, which immediately affected our children. Throughout their lives, they've observed his ups and downs and seen his struggle with rage and anxiety. It has affected their behaviors and perspectives about life. I have seen this play out in all three of my boys. Daniel has struggled with anger, extreme anxiety, and other negative learned behaviors. Evan has had bouts of anger. Liam alternately clings to me and displays oppositional behaviors. All three boys started to turn to me rather than Chris for comfort, and this broke both of our hearts. Christopher started having more and more panic attacks as depression increased. As we became more educated on his condition, we learned that it was not situational depression. It was not oppression, as many in our own circles like to call it. It was clinical depression, and there is a difference. Evangelizing began to take a toll on him. I was still praying for answers and healing. God did not take away the problems, but he walked with us through them. He literally held both of our hands. Chris was on one side and I was on the other. He never promised he would take away the storms, the trials, the fire, but he did promise he would be with us and never leave us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil that I wrought in thy death that comfort me. Another scripture I leaned on and I still do is Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. I literally would quote that every day, several times a day. I leaned on the scripture so many times, and I still do. God was working on our behalf, even though we absolutely could not see it. He was working. He never stops working on our behalf. The answer was on the way, and we had no idea it was coming. In 2013, we moved to Buffalo Gap, Texas, and Chris worsened. His condition worsened. His panic attacks increased, both in severity and in number. His depression deepened. His sensory overload symptoms were at its prime. Anxiety dominated his life and the rage was worse than ever. I had fear that he would have a heart attack. But sometimes I actually thought he was having one because not only he was he emotionally and mentally sick, but he was physically sick. I felt hopeless and that this is how we would spend the rest of our lives, just surviving from day to day and not thriving. Although I knew in my heart God had promised abundant life in his word, Chris was growing worse every day. When you live with any form of dysfunction, everyone adapts to it. Friends and extended family members tended to overlook it or compensate for it because that's just how he is. After a while, abnormal becomes normal. You sometimes have to have a breakdown before you have a breakthrough, and you sometimes have to have a setback before you can move forward. Little did I know a breakthrough was literally around the corner. I felt so alone. I didn't feel safe reaching out to anyone. I felt a lot of shame. I didn't want to make my husband look bad. My preacher husband looked bad, so I held in everything and I internalized it and, and stepped it down. I would talk to God about it and pray and cry myself to sleep a lot of nights. We looked pretty good on the outside, but on the inside, I felt as if I was a breaking point and I knew Chris was. I honestly was afraid he could die from this. I did not even know what to pray anymore. I only had what I call side prayers. Psalms 50. 517 says, and I quote, At dusk, dawn, and noon, I sigh deep sighs. He hears. He rescues. My sighs were prayers to God that I did not know what to do anymore. But God, you know, you show, as Sister Sue says. 
Then I suddenly met my mini, Tini McCarty. And if y'all remember her, she spoke here. Her and Kim spoke here a few years ago. God knew what we had need of before we could ask her thing. God knew she lived one block away from me, and he knew she owned a treatment center called Shades of Hope. And it was a literal miracle that we even got the house that we did where we moved. It was all God ordained. When we met, we instantly bonded and became best friends, although she is 34 years older than me. We immediately adopted each other. She became my angel, grandmother of choice, and my little prayer partner. She was the answer to my side prayers. She became the safe place I have needed for so long. She always says over and share, takes half the load, and I was carrying a full load. As I got to know her, I realized she would not judge judge my husband if I had opened up to her. She would not think of it as a moral situation, but as a sickness. So little by slow, I began to open up to her, and she also witnessed things with her own eyes. It didn't take her long to pick up on what was going on. Tenny guided us to the right help. Chris shared with you about the intensives he attended. These intensives were the beginning of healing for both of us, for our family. We both finally found a safe place with no shame attached. Chris is a man of prayer, a prayer warrior to be exact. He prays hours a day sometimes. This man knows how to pray. He knows how to reach God. We believe in praying through, but we have learned that we can still have an unresolved Deep core issues after praying through that only a professional can help us with, and that it will affect our behavior until we work on it and let it go. Chris was open and willing to do anything that was recommended. He was willing to do the work. I admire and respect him greatly for this. I could talk a long time just about that subject, but I don't have time. But I'm just telling you, it takes a lot of courage to do what he did. I don't know a lot of people that would do what he did. while he was going through the process of, of treatment as it related to Christopher's therapy. It was like peeling back the layers of an onion and I was terrified of what might come up as the layers came off or if it would be too much for him or us to face. Some days were very hard and I questioned if I had made it all up in my head. I also questioned if he really even had a problem. After all, not every single day was bad. There were lots of good days in there. There were days of denial, and then there were days of floodgates open, and I could not stop crying. Thankfully, Jesus was holding my hand, and now I had many on the other hand to hold. I was also, I also found the strength to open up to all of our family, and they all reassured us that they supported us. I no longer had to bear it alone. We no longer had to bear it alone. There is healing and honesty for everyone involved. Minnie says it's abusive to point out a problem without giving a solution. She was determined to see us through this to the very end and to help put the puzzle together. After the intensives and weekly counseling, there still seemed to be a missing piece. She felt like there may be something more to Chris's story. She felt as if there was an undiagnosed mental sickness. She gently pushed and supported Chris to go to a neuropsychologist and to be tested for Asperger's syndrome. She even made the call for us. That's how she pushed. <laughs> she does not give up. A part of me was in denial about this. Do you know what denial means? It means don't even know I'm lying. I had in my mind a certain picture for mental illness, and it was not my husband. Around that time, God allowed my path to cross with a lady who was married to someone with Asperger's and had two sons with it. She sent some books to me about this subject, and one in particular really resonated with me. It was entitled Late Diagnosis, Diagnosis of Asperger's Syndrome. After I read it and had highlighted almost every sentence on every page, I thought maybe many might be right about this. So I approached Chris about it, and once again, he willingly agreed to do whatever it would take. So we went to see Dr. Brinkman. The testing was going to be over $1,500, and we did not have the finances to do this. Dr. Brinkman not only prayed over us in his office, but he said he wanted to do the testing for free to bless our ministry. To my mind, filled with fear, this was only another confirmation that we were on the right track, that God was ordaining our steps. He orders our steps, like y'all saying about earlier. He took the grueling test, and the answer came. At 40 years old, he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. This was a very liberating day because we finally had some answers. Chris was always high-functioning, but there were obvious signs that something was not quite normal, whatever normal means. There were times throughout our marriage that had seen Chris experience a lack of emotional understanding, and there were some inconsistent social behaviors. As a wife, I felt a huge burden on my shoulders to compensate for that lack of understanding. And sometimes, 
felt alone in our marriage. I did not understand at those times what was really going on. Christopher was living smack dab in the middle of the line of a normal brain and the autism spectrum. The diagnosis helped us. So he would, it's like this line and he would just weave in and out. So it was very confusing. As a, um, the diagnosis helped us to see that we were not making anything up and we were not struggling with a spiritual battle. People like to call mental illness a spiritual battle because they are not educated about what mental illness is or they have not lived with it. And it is easy to blame someone's behavior on symptoms of the devil. In our case, Christopher's diagnosis affirmed so many things in our life and answered so many questions. The neuropsychologist also recommended some mild medications to help with Christopher's chemical imbalance. Again, we're being very raw here today. We slowly but surely started seeing healing take place. The answer was never medication alone, nor was it talk therapy alone. A combination of prayer, the Word of God, and Christopher working on those deep core issues through counseling and intensive therapy with the mental health professionals along with support groups finally brought a glimmer of hope into our lives. That was a recipe for us for healing. Chris could not fully see the promises of God until he could get those core issues out of the way. He had the answer. We had the answer all along. He began, began attending 12-step group meetings, which also prepared his mind to see God's plan. It helped him understand that we were powerless over the situation. Can I get an amen from my celebrate recovery people? And that God was the only help. I attended... I attended some Al-Anon meetings to help me to see this. So much of living with a person with mental sickness is like living with an alcoholic. It is as, as if they are drunk on their emotions, if that makes sense. In essence, Chris would go through the addiction cycle with bouts of rage. It starts with a feeling, emotional buildup, thought, which leads to a blow up, and then ends in guilt, shame, and remorse. Then this cycle would repeat again and again, and it becomes habitual after a time. I was surprised to learn that these 12 steps came straight out of James and Ephesians, straight out of the Word of God. Of course, everything we need is from the Word of God. Every step I heard in these rooms, I could relate to a scripture. We didn't have a solid recovery, so I actually went to some open AA and al and whatever I could find. And it was straight from the Word of God. But they talked about it in such a practical way, I could relate to it in so many situations, my own ministry, and just dealing with people and just with life. So we have a recovery group. We call it Life Recovery. We all, I just urge any of you, I'm just giving a CR plug here. No one asked me to do this. But if you're not going, go, because it will help you to be a better Christian. <laughs> Honestly, these meetings helped me, like I just said, to be a better Christian and a leader. I just sat and listened. I learned a lot, and I was amazed at the honesty and how everyone shared and supported each other without shame. I learned how to pray and say the word of God at church, but I learned how to be honest about my problems and listen to others without shame or judgment and to set healthy boundaries in these rooms. And of course, from under many. Of course, I always measure everything I hear and learn up to the word of God. Please do not misunderstand me. Everything I've said here, this is our story and how God chose to bring healing into our family. I do believe he can heal instantly. I do. I can say this with complete confidence because I have walked this road and have seen many miracles happen and prayers answered in the past few years. I have seen life come back into my husband's eyes. I have literally seen physical color restored into his countenance. I believe 100% that God will heal and bring deliverance if we allow him to. Sometimes he heals instantly, but most of the time he expects us to roll up our sleeves and take the initiative to do the hard work and take action ourselves. That's where the healing comes. Like the quote says, I found that if I pray for God to move a mountain, I must be prepared to wake up the next day to a shovel. It's just practical here. <laughs> strategically place professionals and people in our lives to help bring healing to our situations and to help us get to the place where we are cleaned out and ready to receive the healing. Everything we need to get us through this life is found in the Word of God, and in many cases it takes a professional or a support group to help us see that. I want to encourage all of you to be open to whomever God puts in your life. He puts angels in our lives when we need them the most. Our help and healing may not come to us in the traditional way we expected. My sweet preacher husband received the healing of a lifetime 
The Shades of Hope. It's a treatment center, y'all. A treatment center that treats all addictions and specializes in eating disorders with a primary focus on childhood trauma. Yet, there were no addictions in his life, and the help he received has certainly worked. So I encourage you to stay open to anything. Grandmother Kilgore's prayers lived on long after she passed away, and I have watched over 20 years of my own prayers being answered. God's timing is always perfect. So if there's any of you mothers or grandmothers or parents, fathers praying for, for your children, don't stop praying. You might not see the miracle in your lifetime, but it will happen. It will happen. God will pour that out in his perfect timing. He never comes too early or too late. He is right on time. I do not want to go through all of those dark times again. But when I reflect on those times, I realize that I would not change one thing because it has made me who I am. It made me stronger. Those darkest days were some of the most sacred times in my life with God. My walk with God, that is when I felt Him the closest. Just as a parent holds their child close to their chest when they are hurting, I felt God's loving arms holding me and Chris during those dark, dark days. Psalms 34 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. We have known him in the fellowship of his suffering and has made me a much better person. I have so much more compassion and love for others because of it. Never one time did I feel he had forsaken us. He has walked with us every step of the way. Never one time did I keep my eyes off of him. That is what kept me and it still does today. Is our life perfect now? No, it will never be perfect because we are perfectly imperfect human beings in constant need of a perfect God. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. We will still have some rough days, but our worst days now are equal to our best days before healing took place. It takes constant work and putting one step in front of another, doing the next right thing one day at a time. It takes putting on the full armor of God each day. Sometimes several times a day as we slip and we take it off. The greatest battle we ever face is between our two ears. How does recovery, I'm going to end with this, how does recovery look for us now? We can call each other out in our codependency and laugh about it and quickly get on back on track. We learn that the, even our kids are starting to say, well, you're being codependent, mom. <laughs> we learn that the insecurities and battles Chris faced in his mind all those years had a name, codependency. And by the way, it turns out that I have a little case of it myself, caretaker here. On a really rough day, besides praying, I reach out to my safe place for support, where before I just stuck it in. Chris does the same thing. And you have to be careful who you reach out to, I will say that. We both have learned how to keep healthy boundaries. Our family now understands what is going on when Chris has a rough day. Our parents have been very supportive. So grateful Mom and Rod are here today. They've been so supportive through it all, and they have prayed too. They have prayed over the years. I attend a Life Recovery Connect group at my church that my dear friend, Kim Tinney's daughter, leads, which y'all know Kim's talked here, but how God works both ways from us meeting them. Now, Kim has a Holy Ghost baptized in Jesus' name, leading a recovery group at our church. So they helped us, but we helped them. And I can now approach Chris about a crisis we or I am having, and he can actually hear me and give some input before I was afraid to approach him. Of course, if I approach them at the right time, is that every wife or is that just me? <laughs> I also set aside time for self-care, something I never did before our healing. I keep a grateful journal when I'm having a bad day and focusing on all the negativity, and I just start writing down all the good things. You can't be hateful when you're grateful. <laughs> and you know what? That list, that grateful list on Chris is very long. I don't know of too many other dads as hands-on as him. Except Jeremy, he's pretty hands-on too. <laughs> Minnie has become a prayer partner. We meet early morning, nearly every weekday that we can for a short time, what we call is prayer and share. This has been such a strength to me, and I would encourage all of you to pray God leads you to a special prayer partner and try to make it a few times a week that you have prayer and share, whether it be in person or on the phone. We all have FaceTime. There's different ways you could do this. They don't have to live down the street from you like she does. This can be life-changing just to have someone to share with. The Bible says to bear one another's burdens. We do not have to walk alone. We stop in the middle of our crisis, and we ask God to help us right then. 
We invite them into our problems and we ask for strength to get through it and we reach out to another human being we can trust. We do not hold it in and step it down any longer. We are teaching our children these tools at a young age. We have seen the importance to recognize what is changing life in general into a generational curse. A medical situation with emotional symptoms and behaviors caused unmanageable problems and behaviors that transferred to our children. These problems carry on into every family until someone breaks the cycle. This and this, that's a whole other subject. This goes back generations, what Chris has experienced. What might begin as a medical, mental, or emotional challenge can become learned negative behaviors in our offspring, which can then transmit from generation to generation. Chris and I have chosen to stop this cycle and stand against it, affecting those who will follow after us. We are breaking this generational curse one day at a time in the name of Jesus. God makes all things beautiful in his perfect timing. Ecclesiastes, one of my favorite scriptures, Ecclesiastes 3.11. He is not finished making our story beautiful. We are still a work in progress, and we see more healing with each day. But little by slow, I am seeing beauty. And he gives beauty for ashes, strength for fear, gladness for mourning, and peace for despair. If he can do this for us, I know he can do it for you. If you are ready to roll up your sleeves and do the work. Thank you, Jesus. I'm convinced this morning as we stand, the beginning of your recovery and healing from anxiety, mental illness, addictions, grief, pain, or anything else is one trip to the altar this morning and one phone call away to a professional help you need, along with admitting to God you are powerless over your situation. Acceptance is the answer to all of our problems. Until we can accept there is a problem and reach out for help, we cannot receive our healing. Healing, strength, and restoration is available to anyone who is willing to peel back the layers of past wounds and make raw confession and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to a safe place. Your new and abundant life is before you today. In the presence of the King, the healer of broken hearts, not only mental, emotional, and spiritual healing awaits you, but a new chapter in the book of your life is waiting to start as we lift our hands this morning. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. There are two different types of testimonies. There's a church testimony and there is a real testimony. God is transforming lives today by His healing power into a real testimony of healing and of deliverance and of the grace of God and the love of God. And so we want to open up this altar this morning. Anyone that would like to come, if you want to come in families or if you'd like to come in groups or as individuals, why don't we come and gather around at this time as we get ready to transition in this service and lift our hands to the Lord right now and just open up your heart and allow Him to touch you today. Amen.